Good afternoon. Welcome to Threat Modeling in the Cloud. I am Paige Cruz, developer advocate over at Chronosphere. And I want you to look at this vending machine and think about what threats you can come up with that are likely for a given vending machine. Maybe somebody hungry who forgot their pocket change and wants a free snack. Maybe a raccoon, if this is outside at a public park, raccoons got those opposable thumbs. Uh, maybe something more nefarious like credit card skimming. But what if that vending machine was in a hospital? What if your threat model would not be the same given a hospital? So we'll look at this hilarious memo, uh, which zoomed in says, warning, do not use endoscopy equipment to steal chocolate from this vending machine. And I am willing to bet, you know, maybe something small like $5, uh, that you did not have this on your threat model <laughs> as your options for threats. Um, and what is very important that took me a long time to come around with, with this idea of threat modeling is it's highly dependent on your environment, whether you're in a hospital or a park um, or at a school. Um, just because you have one vending machine somewhere doesn't mean that you could have a copy and paste threat model to take everywhere with you. So <laughs> what exactly is threat modeling? It has one of those nice parallels to outside of computing. We as humans threat model all the time. If you look both ways before you cross the street, you were probably worried you'd be flattened like a pancake, so you took some actions to mitigate that risk. Um, and to not bury the lead, it is literally about assessing your situation and ranking and prioritizing threats by likelihood and impact. So a very official academic definition here um, is that it's a structured process to identify security requirements, pinpoint threats and potential vulnerabilities, quantify their impact and likelihood, and prioritize remediation methods. It is not making a big long list of everything that could go wrong that stresses you out and keeps you up in the middle of the night and turning that into do, to a to-do list. Um, it is kind of taking that down, what is likely and what is worth us going after. A more uh, real world definition that I uh, vibe with a little bit more is that threat modeling is a conversation. Uh, similarly to when we talk about DevOps, you know, you can get into the tool chain, you can get into the practices, but if your first step isn't talking to somebody on a different team or in a different org, you're doing it wrong. So um, very similarly, you want to be talking to as many people as possible. When you're starting a threat modeling conversation, um, especially if you're not in security, you wonder where to start. And there are four guiding questions that come from the threat modeling manifesto. What are we working on? You would be shocked how many teams would come up with different definitions for the work they do or why their service is important to an org. So first things first, what are we working on? What is it that we're doing here? My favorite, um, especially for those of us that are nervous Nellies, what could go wrong? This is your fun time to list um, endoscopy equipment, raccoons stealing the Reese's from the snack machine. List out all of the things and then take a look at what are we gonna do about it? So if say someone's like, oh my God, what if a meteor hits you know, this AZ? You're like, okay, what would we be able to do about it? How likely is that maybe we wanna look at our, you know, our configuration on S3 that is a little bit more likely to cause a security incident for us than, um, <laughs> than a meteor taking out an AZ. Um, this, com this question really helps you ground the discussion in reality um, and, and can avoid some of those rabbit holes that folks like to get into. And finally, did we do a good enough job? This is really the crux of the sort of threat modeling feedback loop. It's not a conversation you have once, it's a conversation you have many times. And good enough is subjective to your org, your customers or end users, your team. Um, it does not imply perfection. It is not, do, are we 100% secure? That's as silly as saying, we're gonna have 100% uptime. Like that's not gonna happen. So defining what is good enough and what is enough risk to accept and enough risk that you can mitigate is sort of what puts a whole bow on this threat modeling conversation. Um, and I will say, I do recommend 
threatmodelingmanifesto.org. It is not lost on me that they need to update their SSL cert, and I, that is very ironic, um, but it is a very good resource aside from that. So who's invited to this discussion? You might think, okay, your security team. You might think maybe the software engineers, maybe we bring a manager or two in who's got context. Um, but you would be surprised at how wide you should go to have invitations. Your architect is gonna have a really good high level view of the system, not only the technical components and how they interact, but as well as what teams work well together, what areas of the org maybe have a little bit of a rougher history and would need um, to have some meetings before the meeting to make sure that this conversation is productive. Of course, your software developers who are gonna bring perspectives from their daily experience contributing to a particular feature or service or set of services. Customer support is one, uh, they, are, they are a group that gets often left out of design discussions and security discussions, but there is no better person than somebody that works directly with customers to know not only how they're currently using the system, but how they abuse the system or the things that are important to them, um, whether it be different security implications for SOC 1, SOC 2, um, they're the ones who are on the front lines getting all of that information from customers, so you definitely want to invite them. And of course, um, if you've got QA, quality assurance, please bring them to the table. They are holding on to all of the knowledge of the weak spots, uh, the untested, the unexamined points. Um, they probably already have a list in their head of things that they would like to be addressed and fixed. Bring them to the table. And finally, I don't know if you had tech writers on your list, but they also are a group that you want to bring to the table because what good is a security fix feature or configuration if your users don't know about it and it's not documented. Um, this will come up later, but the tech writer plays a very important role um, in the system. So threat modeling, it is a conversation. Um, while there is artifacts that get produced as the result of that conversation, sort of a report, these are the risks we see, this is how we think we want to mitigate them, um, the real important part of this is the conversation that happens. The report is great to refer to afterwards, to have action items, but you really want to have the conversation. Great. So it sounds pretty uh, applicable, right? Whether you're cloud or on-prem, what would make threat modeling in the cloud different? Um, because running in the cloud does not mean that you get to offload all of your threat modeling to Google or AWS or whoever your hosting provider is. Um, there's this notion of a shared responsibility model. So there's a line at which you need to worry about what's going on inside your VPC, say, and there's what Google, AWS, so on and so forth have to worry about. But there's that line in the middle where you both meet and it's very important to not just absolve yourself of security concerns because someone else, uh, the, the Google SREs can take care of it. So this is a big long list. We're not gonna talk about all of these, but if you take a look at these, maybe take a second and pull out in your mind what you think the top three threats specifically to cloud-based environments are. This, is, uh, this comes from the Cloud Security Alliance. This is what they call the Egregious 11, sort of like the OWASP top 10 for web app vulnerabilities. All right, we've got data breaches, misconfiguration and inadequate change control. And the one that gets me is the lack of cloud security architecture and strategy. Like that is, in my mind, that is sort of when somebody, an organization says, we're going to the cloud and they take a very much like a lift and shift approach. We'll take what we have, we'll put it in the cloud and everything will work, don't need to change our processes. Um, nope, that definitely does not work. And we'll double click into each of these. Data breaches. Um, if you have been a human with an email address and use that email address as a login anywhere, you are definitely in the crowd of people who have had their data breached, their PII, um, just it's hit medical providers, it's hit educational institutions. There's really almost nowhere that hackers haven't tried to get data in or out of. And when I was prepping for this, I discovered that Last LastPass is actually facing consequences for two data breaches that they had. Oftentimes as end users or consumers, we 
kind of left out of, of companies facing the consequences for this kind of stuff. So what happened <laughs> is um, one of their competitors tried to capitalize, said, ah, never been breached. This is not going to age well. I can already tell you that. Um, it's not as easy as saying, we'll, we'll just not get breached. Um, again. <laughs> Because it, why are they facing a class action lawsuit? Why are consequences being wrought for LastPass versus any one of the other providers you can find on haveibeenpwned.com? Well, it was not just that they got hacked. It was the way in which they responded to that. So kind of a big, a big long thing from the, the lawsuit. But it says, instead of waiting months, if they had just disclosed the full extent of the breaches when they knew, then the end users could have had time to, one, like switch password providers, two, change their passwords and really limit the scope of the impact there. Because they didn't do that, there were months that their users were basically left out in the open, and that it is sort of the mishandling of that security incident that is biting them. Because, like we said earlier, you're not going to be 100% hack-proof. You're not going to be 100% secure, 100% reliable. So we can't litigate every single case of that, but we can litigate when people are not um, taking responsibility and notifying people of risks when they know. It's sort of similar to when folks uh, who find bugs, security researchers find bugs, and they say, all right, told this big company. Uh, they haven't done anything, haven't seen a patch, haven't seen a release, and you wait whatever period of time it is that is reasonable for them to have made those changes before you can release it to the world to say you know that. All right, uh, top two cloud threat is misconfiguration. Um, this one I think about a lot um, because I, I'm hoping somebody was going to build the rest of the gate, but if not, um, very much speaks to how many boxes we have in the cloud, how many new features and products. I can't even keep up with what AWS and GCP release in a given year, um, let alone know how to securely configure them. Some popular issues include unsecured data storage, which we'll talk about, excessive permissions. That's when someone's like, hey, um, I want to spin this thing up in dev. And you're like, oh, OK, I don't want to play whack-a-mole with IAM permissions. So I'm just going to let you allow all star, do whatever you want. Um, or leaving default credentials as is, oh my gosh, please change defaults. Um, and sort of the more extreme example is when you go in and actively disable your security controls. So <laughs> we're going to talk about an example from 2018 where level one robotics um, which is a, I learned, is an engineering company that works with a lot of big car manufacturers like Volkswagen, Chrysler, Ford, Toyota, GM, Tesla, and the elevator people, Tyson Krupp. Okay, so they have a pretty impressive customer base. Um, what happened here is they had an rsync server that allowed unauthenticated data transfer to any rsync client. It wasn't level one's data that was... Um, at risk of being taken. It was their customers. Like, what a breach of trust there. Um, that would be really hard for me to recover from that. So wild. Like, this stuff really happens all the time to very big names. That is why we want to take security very seriously. And our final threat is the lack, just total lack of cloud security. I, whoever came up with the egregious 11 props on just transparent naming, um, does what it says on the tin. So. Many of us, uh, most of the time I work in SRE and reliability work, and there's sort of this idea of the big one. Until a company has that big incident that floats up to the top of the C-suite, it's really hard to get buy-in for reliability initiatives. Very similarly, um, until you have a big breach or a big security risk or maybe a near miss, it can be hard to get investments into security unless you're in a highly regulated industry. But again, I would say there's one year I got I think three medical providers had to send me the oopsie, your, your data got breached, emails. And so at this point, I'm like, what? Nothing's secure. <laughs> Who do we trust? Um, good questions to ask yourself. Um, so what's our example here? Well, Accenture, if you've heard of them. In 2017, they confirmed that they had inadvertently 
left a massive store of private data across four unsecured S3 buckets. It exposed real bad, highly sensitive passwords, secret encryption and decryption keys that could have inflicted tons of damage depending on had somebody, if somebody was able to access it, store it, and make use of it. The S3 buckets also contained hundreds of gigabytes of data for their enterprise cloud offering, AKA their customer's data, and supports most of the Fortune 100 companies. So at this point, we're like, okay, basically all the car people got hacked, uh, the elevator people, now we're talking about a bunch of Fortune 100, like nobody is really immune from thinking about this stuff. Um, and the real like difficult part here was the data could be downloaded without a password by anyone who just knew the web server address. So when you're thinking about this conversation about threat modeling and you're like, what is possible? What is likely? What are things we should think about if we're in the cloud or moving to the cloud? A very great place to start is that egregious 11. Um, it will help you avoid some of the rabbit holes of the, oh my God, a meteor, or <laughs> our whole security team went on a, an offsite together, you know, you know, single point of failure. Start with the egregious 11, work your way through those, and then see how the conversation goes. But what does a successful threat model report look like? We've kind of been talking about the doom and gloom. We will turn to a lovely CNCF project called Argo. Back in 2021, I'm very proud of the CNCF. They tasked Trail of Bits to conduct a component-based threat model for Argo CD, workflows, rollouts, events, kind of the whole Argo ecosystem. And if you're unfamiliar with what they do, it's, it's really like CICD progressive deployments, all like Kubernetes native for the cloud. Um, here's a snippet from that threat model that I found really interesting. Um, while Argo services often support risk or threat prevention methods, yay, so like security is there, security configurations are there. They are frequently under-documented and provided on an opt-in basis rather than the default. That goes all the way back to including the tech writer into your conversations. What good are all of these beautiful security features if people can't find the configuration docs, if they don't know it exists? It's unrealistic for us to expect um, for every project that you're using to keep up with the minutia of every single release. So yay for tech writers. <laughs> but I get it. I was a developer one day, once upon a time. Writing documentation can be hard. We can get writer's block. We don't know what level of information to provide. Are we trying to help a new person who's not on our team spin up our app? Are we is this just something internal only for the platform or SRE team? And you don't need to go into details of how to set up Terraform. Like, it, I get that it can be difficult. Um, and one of the findings from the Argo threat model was this concept of minimal service documentation. What is sort of the minimum amount so you don't need to get writer's block, you don't need to be frustrated. Um, what's just enough so that any one of those groups we talked about, whether it's your tech writer, whether it is your QA, whether it's developer, PM, whoever, what is just enough info for them to understand the scope of what the service or feature does um, and be able to participate in the threat modeling combo. We're not gonna read all of this, but what I wanna point out is these last two sentences, just very straightforward. After a workflow is com completed, a copy of the workflow is made and stored in a SQL database. Produce artifacts are stored in services like S3 and Minio. Simple, it's to the point, it's following the flow of data, which is something that we are concerned about, um, and it's not going off into rabbit holes. Beautiful, something to aim for. And at the end of this presentation, um, there is a section for, I think it's about five or six questions that you can answer that fulfills minimal service documentation. So you can use that as a template and throw it in a readme. So what about threat modeling and you? This is strategies and sort of a roadmap for you to follow to conduct your own threat modeling conversation. If it's a new practice for you, maybe you don't have a security team yet or security engineer, start small. Pick maybe the most important feature or workflow. Maybe pick one single service to start with. Um, it should be an important one. <laughs> um, then you wanna schedule the meeting. Um, add in the agenda the four guiding questions. If you are not using the agenda field in your meeting, your meeting invites, 
oh my gosh, <laughs> this is the time to start. We want people to come to the table prepared, understanding why they're there, what they're there to talk about, their responsibilities, and sort of what the end goal is. So if you give people the four guiding questions up front, give them time to think about it in the background, do some more research, and come really well prepared. Um, then, <laughs> assuming that you also are bringing in your tech writers and your folks who don't typically think of themselves as security practitioners or professionals, send them the threat modeling manifesto. It is very short. It is like maybe two scrolls on a web page. Um, and just let them become familiar with what this process and this conversation is going to be. Because again, the whole goal is a very fruitful discussion, um, which will not happen if people don't understand what they're doing and why it matters. Another great thing to have before the meeting is that minimal service documentation. Take a stab at answering those five or six questions that I'll throw up at the end. Um, and as a visual learner, a picture is worth a thousand words. Go ahead and make an architecture diagram. Go ahead and make that request workflow. Um, if you've got distributed tracing, you get that for free. Um, go ahead and take a picture of that service chart. Now, this is also, this is just like good meeting habits that I don't see uh, practiced often enough. Assign a scribe to capture notes. Um, that is very important so that person can clarify, uh, can slow the roll if a bunch of people start diving in or disagreeing or things get heated. The scribe can say, hey, I'm trying to keep a record. Like, let's slow down one at a time. Can you repeat that? Very important role. And the second role that you want to have is a facilitator. They keep time. They make sure no rabbit holes are, are gone down. Um, and they're there to just steward everybody through this process. And finally, um, sharing is caring. Tell everybody your findings, write them up, um, and then go to the next feature, the next service, whatever it is. Um, maybe make this a monthly meeting, a weekly meeting. Figure out a cadence that works for you until you've got um, kind of a good set and a good understanding of risks and how you want to mitigate them or if they're worth mitigating in the first place. Dow Jones. Big company, uh, big, has a big impact on the world. What happened with Dow Jones and security? In 2019, they experienced a data exposure. Um, and what happened is an unauthorized third-party vendor failed to password protect an AWS-hosted Elasticsearch instance. And because of that, that database was available to anybody and was very easily found by any IoT-like search engines. It was not even security through obscurity, like people could find this. Um, and this misconfigured database was not even discovered by Dow Jones. It was discovered by a security researcher who reported it. Props to them. And if we wanted to take a look at how would we write this down in a threat model, or how do we think about this um, type of situation. Most of us probably have hosted AWS resources or cloud resources. You don't always operate every single thing yourself um, or on bare metal. So we would say, all right, an actor, that's what we'll call our attacker. Um, they, <laughs> any actor would be able to, with a very simple search, access this database and get the data inside. Okay, what is the impact there? Well, depends on what data is in there. We talked earlier about uh, a data breach that involved passwords, a data breach that involved encryption keys. Like that scope of impact is huge. Maybe it's an encryption key for something in your staging environment. Less of an impact than something in production, still not great, and you should still probably have the same sorts of security configurations all throughout your environments. Um, but that's sort of one way to think about it. Who is this actor who's attacking? And the fun part about security, it can be an external threat or it can be an internal threat. Um, lots, of, lots of scenarios to think through. And so again, the thing to take away is threat modeling is not a report. It's not a checklist. It's not this passive activity that regulators are forcing you to do. It is a very real conversation between all of the different people who work on a system that are in charge of making it reliable, available, and secure. Um, if you have data that you care about, you should be having these types of conversations. So um, the slides are available. I've, everything that I've referenced here, um, these are all links, the, the manifesto. I threw in OWASP's top 10 web apps because that's just good to have. 
Um, if you would like a very fun dive into security vulnerabilities, Hiding Malware in Docker Desktop is one of my favorite reads. I go back and read it like once a year. Um, and then the MITRE Attack Adversarial Knowledge Base. They've got a 101 blog post on getting started, but they also have a huge list of different specific attacks and scenario. So if you're having trouble coming up with what you think they could be for your org or your system, or you just wanna ground the conversation in reality, People have done this research. It is available. Um, definitely make use of it. And again, here is that minimal service doc documentation. And you want to think, think back to those two sentences of that data workflow. Simple, high level, run it by somebody before. Don't just call it good. Maybe run it by someone, say, is this too much, too little? Um, a feedback framework I use is ABCD. What's awesome, what's boring, what's cool, and what doesn't need to be there? Um, and again, we definitely, you're focusing on the data workflow because that's often what people are trying to get at the end of the day. And again, the egregious 11, this is them in order of egregiosity, I suppose, um, with our top three that we already talked about. And let's chat. I will be around the conference. I generally wear exciting things and I will be staffing the CNCF booth G3 this Friday afternoon. I'm on Mastodon. You can ping me at my work email if you would like, or you can visit my blog post. Most of it's on security reliability stuff, but I am delving more and more into security these days after hearing this stat that was something like, I know I'm gonna get it wrong now because I'm thinking about it on the spot, but it was like 80% of developers don't consider security to be a part of their job which like, wow, shame on us, we need to do better. Um, and I'm hoping today you can also start to be that change and have a threat modeling conversation tomorrow when you get back to work um, with your family. It's a, it's a very good practice to get into. And with that, we've got some time for questions. And if not, uh, thank you very much. Oh. There we go. Hi, uh, awesome talk. I learned a lot. Um, practically, when um, I look at um, services, uh, oftentimes there's like, um, there are just too many. <laughs> <laughs> uh, microservices, what a mistake. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, how, how does one do threat modeling when they have hundreds and hundreds of microservices that they deployed without realizing that threat modeling was a thing and they should have done it? Yeah, that in that case, that's where I would go to the workflow approach. So all of those microservices, at the end of the day, they're all work, most of them are working together to fulfill a smaller subset of user needs. So whether that's login, whether that's checkout, whether that's I'm gonna upload my passport so that United can pre-book me or whatever, like very sensitive data, definitely hope they're, hopefully they're not on my breach list next year. Um, so I would think through maybe what are the top 10 workflows or what are the most critical if you work with big companies or small companies, who do you need to protect what data and why? And then maybe as far as the services go, that's where you wanna, I think I keep hearing this thing called like the Salsa framework. Like there's a lot of things you can do for the automated platform platformification of security scans and stuff. I would throw that on, sprinkle that on your microservices, but save the conversations for those bigger workflows that traverse multiple. Then you'll be bringing multiple engineering teams to the table and it'll, it'll be a richer discussion. Yeah. It's kind of the same thing with monitoring, like uh, so many microservices, SLOs, go to the workflow, go to the, the things that your users are actually doing with the system. This is overwhelming. Any more questions? Is there any uh, tools to automate like the threat modeling to like just grab some of the information from these services? To 
fill so, in some of the, like, instead of having a meeting with, like, each team and asking all these questions? Or, yeah, so the question, because I, th I think the mic's a little low, the question is, um, how can we automate this? What if we've got a bunch of teams or services? What can we do to um, sort of speed this along or do this at a, at a bigger scale? Yeah, because it, it might change also. Like they, they that can... changes all the time. Yeah, yeah. Cloud, <laughs> clouds are very dynamic, um, <laughs> especially if you've got lots of the microservices. So in that case, when I, when I hear things like automation, how do we do this at scale, I think, what is machine readable? What's available? If you have, if you use GitHub or GitLab, there are uh, like PR templates. Make the minimal service documentation a template. Um, then from there, you could write a parser or whatever, do your JQ or your YQ, pull out the data. And then essentially what I didn't get into is the, I don't know if I can pull it up, but the Argo threat model, the report that comes out is a big table. It says, these are the risks that we see in order this is um, the component it affects, this is the, the risk or the threat, and then this is either we're gonna patch it, either we're gonna redesign it, or we're gonna leave it alone because it's not a big deal. So what you could automate is sort of the generation of that report and then at least have smaller discussions about what are you gonna do about it because the computer, can, computer can't tell us <laughs> how to secure itself, otherwise I, I wouldn't be here having this talk. So you can automate the drudgery of that, totally. Um, and then just scope the conversations really targeted to, we're only gonna talk about the top two on this list. Um, or, you, I mean, you could have people submit a form. Eh. <laughs> I, I'm big on the conversations, just as an SRE, we're left out a lot in the design, and it's always better to just catch something early on. Yeah, go Seahawks, love the hat. All right. Excited to hear how all of your threat modeling conversations go. We're going to secure the world. No more breaches. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.